uh, a case study from uh, Madagascar. Mr. Derek is a program manager uh, of the Belgium NGO Protos. He has over 30 years experience in SAP countries, Latin America working in um, water supply and sanitation, uh, including re uh, irrigation and integrated water resources management. Um, since 2006, Mr. Derek has been working in Madagascar, and we are looking forward to hear the story from there. Mr. Derek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this presentation was prepared with uh, the cooperation of uh, Francesca Rossi who is the country representative in Madagascar, and Harold van der Hoek, who is our sanitation expert in the head office. Uh, last week we got a friendly visitor to our treatment plant, so I decided to put him on the first slide there in the left corner. Um, okay. We're talking about the sanitation uh, chain of Tomasna. Tomasna is in the east coast of uh, Madagascar. Uh, it's a town of 300,000 uh, people. It's the second town of the country, a big uh, harbor, the biggest harbor. Uh, we did a base study a few years ago, and so we found that the slush production is estimated at 14,000 cubic meters a year. 90% of them are emptied, 10% are abandoned, so just uh, left. There's no sewer system, so uh, all that is uh, empty, 98% 98 of that is just dumped, and mostly dumped in the garden. And there's 1% is, uh, um, is mechanical, 76% is manual service, and 13% people do it them, themselves. Uh, since, since that the living space is decreasing, Dumping the sludge in, in the own uh, garden is becoming more and more uh, uh, a problem for the people. So uh, how did we attack the, the problem with the sanitation chain? We used a multi-actor approach. So we started as a, 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 a classic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I have to remove the situation. I'm very sorry there. approach okay we started as a, as a classic uh, latrine project constructing some more than a thousand uh, latrines uh, and our focus group was obviously the lowest income group uh, people of, of uh, Tomatev and when we uh, uh, started to build on the uh, sanitation chain the lowest income families were our main uh, target group so we wanted to, to construct something that would be not would be only for the rich people, but also for the lowest income. Uh, as a second stakeholder, there was the local authority, town council. Uh, of course, everybody knows it's a, it's a lot of work working with town councils. But after a, a lot of effort, they came through and they delivered what we needed, the license. They even gave us uh, land to build uh, the treatment plant. Uh, we asked for external help, so we had uh, some uh, uh, technical know-how coming from local partners, and the, uh, the local NG the NGO uh, Practica, who helped us with the startup of the service, and we had uh, SIA Consult, uh, who did a presentation this morning, uh, Pierre-Henri Dodan, who is here in, with us today. He guided us in... Uh, choosing the treatment uh, that was appropriate for uh, the, our project. And he made sure that uh, the, the treatment went well in the years following the startup. So, and last we had uh, a water training center, a national water training center, uh, who was responsible for the plant management during the experimentation phase, 17-18. And we got some uh, hundred students coming through the station to try to get to know uh, what the technology was about. So that's that. 
So we have been uh, using action research for severely a trial, uh, trial error uh, process. We started in 2012 with, uh, with the basic studies. In 2015, uh, we started to work together with the startup, young startup, Clean Impact, who was willing to work with us on developing the service and, and the treatment chain. So today, that same uh, company is still there. It's an independent company. It continues the service, and since the beginning of this year, it's also responsible for the management of the uh, treatment plan. So we invested in, in that company uh, some 70,000 uh, US dollars in uh, um, material, equipment. They have a small team, one manager, one operation technician, one driver, five empties and two, person, uh, two persons who manage the, the um, treatment uh, plant. So, as I said, it was a uh, um, real trial and error, so we, we tried almost anything because we wanted, really wanted to keep the cost as, as low as possible. And finally, we, we got today what we have is a motor cultivator with a trailer. That's because the lowest income they're all also in the more difficult accessible areas. So to get them, uh, we needed something smaller. We work with little plastic drums, 50 liters up to one cubic meter, depends where we are. Also again, to try to serve those lowest income uh, people. Uh, we bought a tractor with, with a trailer to furthermore transport all the sludge to the uh, treatment plant. And at the end of last year, we invested in a slurry tanker uh, who, uh, who will help to approve, uh, 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 get better the, the profitability of, of our service because we can get to the uh, bigger clients that way. So what's the cost for a client in, in uh, Madagascar? It's around 28 US dollars a cubic meter. We have a special price for the lowest income people who pay uh, 22 US dollars uh, per cubic meter. So there's, there's a kind of internal solidarity where the lowest co income people uh, pay less than the other clients, although the cost for serving the lowest income people is higher since it's more difficult to access. Uh, then, so what does it give in numbers? Last year, we had a total volume of uh, 681 cubic meters. The service had 433 customers, and the sludge that, we, uh, that was empty corresponded with a population of uh, 12,500 persons, which is more or less the lower limit to make the service uh, viable. Um, if, you, if you see then uh, over the years, because we started the experiment in 2014, um, the annual volume has risen from 300 to maximum 750. Last year it, it uh, went down a little bit, but it's, uh, you can see it, it's stagnating. So there are bi two, two big groups. There are the small barrel and pit latrines who are 20% of, of the volume. These are the lowest income uh, people. And the septic tanks are 80% of the volume. If you see the, the, the number and type of clients, 40% of our clients are the barrel and pit latrines or the lowest income families. So we are ra rather happy that uh, we have succeeded in, uh, in getting access for those lowest income people to the service. Uh, so 60% is the septic tank clients. What does it give in money terms? So we have an income, as you can see the smallest latrines they only give us 16% of income. We have a little, we have a problem involving the barrel uh, latrines. And the reason therefore is that when they are filled, they need the service immediately. And so in uh, a logistic, logistic way, we have difficulties to, to serve those people quickly enough. So that's a point we, we still have to work. We are competitive uh, financially, because the traditional emptying, so uh, dumping the, the dumping the sludge in the, in the garden, costs between 16 and 24 uh, US dollars uh, cubic meter. Our price is 22, so we are 
financially com competitive, but it's, it's the problem that we are not quickly enough or we cannot be quickly enough to serve them. So 81% is for the, the, uh, the pit latrines, uh, pit and most are between one and three cubic meters. Uh, important to say here is there are no subsidies in Madagascar, so the service has to uh, function completely on, on uh, an economic basis. Now the, uh, we have the expenditures per month. There are three main uh, items. We have 44% of human resources that uh, the cost is 40% for the human resources. We have a high cost for the transport and maintenance. That's 29%. And we installed a 15% depreciation. So there's a fixed amount of depreci depreciation that company, company has to put aside to pay for uh, further uh, uh, renewing the, the equip equipment. So that makes that, if you see, it's not really impressive. You have $1,528 that goes out, and you had, uh, if you went back, you have $1,575 a month that come in. So that gives a profit margin of 3%, which is really you are at, at the lowest, lowest possible uh, level. So uh, in 2016, we decided to, to do the next step and uh, we built a, a treatment plant. Before 2016, what was emptied was buried in, uh, in rented land. So it wasn't dumped, in fact, it was dumped, but in uh, a more organized way. <laughs> So we have uh, installed 12 kilometers from the town center, uh, a treatment station built uh, with uh, planted humification uh, beds. Yeah. Uh, 12 kilometers from town. There are six beds with a total of 1,700 square meters, and the capacity is 1,000 cubic meters a year. So that is uh, 100 ton of total sludge uh, a year. Um, we have been experimenting with, with two type of plants. One is the Phragmite australis, which is normally used, and the second one is a local found plant that we haven't really d uh, identified, nor have the local uh, specialists done it so, but it seems to be an echinocloa, and most importantly, it's working. This uh, treatment plant costed 270,000 US dollars, and the cost of treatment is 3.1 US dollars a, a cubic meter. Uh, that's the cost, Mo most of the cost is the two persons who are uh, doing the work uh, over there. So there are two operation cycles in the, in, the, in the treatment. There's a short cycle. That's every three to five days, each bed receives or may receive five cubic meter of sludge. Then there's a waiting, po uh, waiting period and drainage period. And the long cycle is it's the, the system, the beds are designed to be filled in three, four years. Uh, accumulation, oh, there it is, okay. Uh, so the long cycle, uh, in three, four years, uh, the idea is that it's filled up to a maximum height of 90 centimeters. So today, uh, we are in the third year. So we did a little experiment last year in, in, in September. We wanted to see if, if our treatment was working, although this cycle wasn't finished, so we, we uh, emptied one bed, and you see there on the picture the, the, the result of, of, of this work, and on the right, uh, right this slide, you see that the bed is re regrowing after our intervention. So the results. These are the first humification beds in Madagascar. As I said, we, it's the third year functioning. We have, uh, the process is adapted to the local conditions, which is a humid climate. There is more or less 3,000 millimeters of rain every year. Uh, sometimes the operational difficulties, they are small. We are sometimes affected with uh, uh, short drought periods, but we have water uh, close by, so we can manage this kind of uh, problem. Up to now, we have uh, treated 1,500 cubic meters of sludge. And as I said, as an experiment, we produced our first uh, 30 cubic meters of, of humus. 
So uh, we try to analyze the quality of that. We have a CN of 10. Uh, the disinfection is, this is the Helmand X. The disinfection was 85% on average on all the layers after a two year period, which is one year short of what it's designed. Uh, that analysis was done in Durban, here in South Africa. And uh, also interesting is that we uh, reached a uh, volume reduction of uh, between 82 and 87%. So in this moment we see that uh, our uh, station will not be filled in three years, but probably it will take some more. So there's a little bit more of a uh, reserve. Okay, now what are the lessons we learned? And more or less, more, what are the challenges? Uh, there is a market, okay? But uh, we are wondering if the necessary management capacities are available for us. We think that the, the, the service that's actually working will be able to get to the uh, volume of 1,000 cubic meters a year. That's the, the also the, the capacity of the treatment. Afterwards, there will be a need for more investment in treatment and also in, in uh, equipment. And we are not sure if this service, the, 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 the team that's there now, will have those capacity. As you saw that the income was $1,500 a month, there's not a lot of space to, to engage uh, high quality uh, engineers or technicians. So uh, it will be a continuing uh, seek and trial, I will say. Um, we are working in a local town context that is very challenging. There's no urban planification in uh, Tamatav. All the roads, most of the roads are sand roads. That's the reason why we, we bought a tractor and not a truck to, uh, uh, to once again get to the lowest income families. We are afraid that this company, they have been working with the lowest income uh, families, but we, are, we think that there should be a subsidy for these people because they are the most difficult and most expensive to serve. And so there is a risk that the, the provider will shift from the lowest income and they give a preference to the higher income families, which should be a change in, uh, in um, what we attend, uh, pretended to do. But maybe this is inevitable in, uh, uh, within a, a private enterprise. So another big problem we see is that the initial investment is uh, very limited for small startups. If you see what the level of income is, uh, a small startup cannot pay this by itself. So there should there is going to be an external input necessary as we have done in this project. So I don't see tomorrow getting another uh, startup beginning investing $70,000 to do the same service. Uh, so for the future, Maybe Bill Gates should pass by and give us a hand. <laughs> and the treatment. So the treatment, we did all the possible, pos all the possible to get, uh, that's the last one. Oh yeah. yeah. So the treatment, uh, the management costs are really low and uh, the necessary competence is also not that high, but still it's, it's a specific profession. So there is a need of some formation for the people to understand the working of, of these uh, beds. And um, the next step, because we just, uh, we just did an experiment on the sludge, on the compost production, so that's now to, to uh, get the local government to accept and to find potential uses of the biosolids uh, in the future. So to conclude, a simple chain but specialized coaching is necessary for development and transfer of capacity. So we did this, uh, there you have all of our partners. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the finance of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we had to go along with the Belgian corporation and with the uh, Agence de l'eau de Adour Garon. So if somebody can give us the, the email of the Bill Gates uh, Foundation, we will be very happy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Donc, la ville de Yaoundé, qui est la capitale du
du Cameroun à près de 3 millions d'habitants. L'assainissement autonome est dominant. Il y a eu quelques réseaux collectifs, mais qui n'ont pas pu être entretenus. Et la production est de l'ordre de 1500 m cubes par semaine. Et la ville n'a pas encore de station de traitement de bout de vidange. Donc, dans la communauté urbaine, les acteurs sont principalement l'État, la communauté urbaine de Yaoundé qui s'occupe des problèmes de gestion de l'entretien et qui fait la police. Il y a les vidangeurs et les ménages qui financent eux-mêmes les les lacrines et les fosses, et c'est aussi eux qui payent les vidanges. Donc, la communauté urbaine a été créée il y a près de plus de 40 ans. Et elle a un plan d'assainissement qui a été actualisé en 2015. Et en 2004, la compétence qui est liée à l'assainissement communautaire, lui, a été transférée. Les bouts de vidange sont dans le cadre de la gestion des eaux usées et la stratégie qui a été adoptée dans la ville consiste à évoluer vers un assainissement collectif de façon progressive. Mais on se heurte au manque que, que, que de financement, ce qui fait qu'on n'a pas pu mettre en œuvre cette stratégie là Et aussi, il n'y a, a pas une concertation entre les acteurs et, 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 et pas assez de données. Ce qui nous a donc conduit maintenant vers la gestion des bouts de vidange qui semble être plus à notre portée. C'est ainsi qu'on se positionne vers une stratégie où la communauté urbaine va essayer de piloter l'ensemble et qui intègre euh, tous les acteurs et qui va comprendre un système d'information géographique, une application smartphone pour, euh, pour le suivi, qui intègre aussi une modernisation des vidangeurs et, une, et la construction de la première station de traitement des bouts de vidange. Voilà un peu, voilà. Les résultats préliminaires de cette prise en main sont donc un état des lieux a déjà été fait. Il y a eu des formations et des visites de benchmarking dans certains villes telles que Dakar et Durban. En 2016, la communauté est entrée dans le processus RASOP qui a permis de faire un peu l'ensemble des choses que je venais de citer là. Et un partenariat a été noué avec l'AIMF qui est l'association des maires francophones, avec l'agence de l'eau Seine Normandie avec le syndicat interdépartemental de l'assainissement dans l'agglomération parisienne et avec l'Agence française de développement pour la construction d'une station, la structuration de la filière et le monitoring de toute la chaîne. Au sein de la communauté urbaine aussi, un service eau et assainissement a été créé et une équipe dédiée a été mise en place pour suivre la GBV et parallèlement un dialogue a été entamé avec tous les acteurs. Les leçons apprises depuis qu'on est entré dans cette dans cette les démarches sont principalement qu'il est important de développer les compétences. 
les échanges d'expériences sont utiles. On a dû voir ce qui a été fait à Kampala, à Dakar, à Durban, ce qui nous a permis de comprendre un peu mieux comment ça fonctionne. Il faut développer progressivement la filière et il est aussi important d'offrir des solutions concrètes aux entreprises de vidange. Dans la perspective, en perspective, on envisage optimiser les outils mis en place, poursuivre le monitoring de la filière, de faire les études de faisabilité des autres stations de traitement des bouts de vidange. On a déjà entamé quelques contacts dans, à cette fin et surtout pour qu'on recherche des financements pour compléter le dispositif qui ne comprend pas qu'une une, une seule station. On, 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 on envisage faire trois stations et faire un réseau collectif dans le centre-ville et qui va donc avoir une grande station de traitement des eaux usées. Les défis à relever sont principalement d'ordre financier, compte tenu du coût qui ne permet pas aux, aux pauvres d'avoir le service. Et surtout aussi, on n'a pas une taxe actuellement qui permet de couvrir ce service. Les défis aussi sont organisationnels pour que la communauté puisse monter en charge au niveau de ses compétences. Et surtout, il faut qu'on réussisse l'exploitation de la première station qui est en chantier. Et il faut qu'on améliore la communication avec toutes les parties prenantes. En conclusion, donc, on se rend compte que la situation de l'assainissement dans la ville est préoccupante au regard des EDD, notamment l'ODD6. Le projet de gestion des bouts de vidange est une opportunité pour fixer les bases de la structuration de cette filière. Il nous reste donc à chercher comment mobiliser les ressources pour qu'on puisse capitaliser ces acquis. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Great Himalaya in the Karakuram at an altitude of uh, 3,200 meters. Uh, coming straight to the point uh, regarding the difficult sludge management program in Leh, it's oops, there was actually no fickle sludge uh, policies in Leh. Uh, the reason behind uh, this is that traditionally for centuries we have used uh, uh, dry toilet in Leh, uh, and these dry, dry toilets are basically of two stories. So on the first story, you know, uh, one get relief and the faces drops down, and after using it, we put uh, uh, plenty, uh, uh, right amount of soil uh, to keep the uh, faces dry. So this practice, uh, and we are practicing this for centuries, and at the end of the year, or uh, depending upon how much time it takes to fill, it goes straight away to uh, the field as a manure to grow barley. Uh, beside this, Leh uh, is also a touristy area. Uh, we receive around uh, uh, 30,000, 30,000, 35,000 tourists uh, during uh, summer season of two to three months. And uh, that was uh, quite a small amount of tourists and we were able to uh, manage things properly. But then for the last eight to 10 years, uh, this tourist uh, boom in uh, Leh, all of a sudden we started uh, receiving uh, more than 10 times of what we used to receive. And that crosses uh, more than uh, 300,000 tourists annually. So with the boom of tourism industry in Leh, people started actually building uh, uh, lots of hotel, hotels and guest houses. So uh, our next, uh, home will be either converted into a hotel or a guest house. So uh, with the hotel and the guest houses, people actually for the first time started 
uh, having this flush toilet. Uh, since this is a new uh, thing for us, so uh, it was not properly managed. So flush toilet, you know, go down into a, a soak pit. It was uh, uh, there was no proper septic tank. There was no concept, and this is this was a new phenomenon for us. So uh, here the problem was that. After flushing it, earlier we used, to, uh, we used to know exactly what happened to our faces, right? You know, right uh, after getting relief uh, at the end, which goes into barley pit to grow uh, good barley. But then here, after flushing, it was mysteriously, you know, lost forever. Uh, so it was quite confusing. Nobody knew what is happening to the, uh, you know, our faces uh, down under earth. So then an organization came and they found, you know, these species are actually mixing up with the water down below. It's, it's contaminating and polluting uh, our uh, underground water. And one more point which is important was that since lay is not entirely covered with uh, pipe drinking water, it, it, it will st still take a few years for 100% coverage. So people actually started uh, having their own boreholes uh, in their hotels they, and they pump out. So it was a kind of, you know, what goes down also comes out, comes up. So that, that became a very big problem for us. So, so this uh, bore well, uh, drinking water from this bore well was not safe. So the government came up with uh, uh, having uh, FST, uh, uh, the sewerage system, a sewerage ne network. But then the problem was that the late town is uh, divided by a fast flowing stream coming from the gl glacier. So one part of uh, the town was not covered. Uh, and uh, in the old, old uh, town, again, because of congestion, we are not able to lay down a sewage system. So the problem was that we were not able to uh, cater uh, uh, the entire town with the new sewerage system. So here, uh, Boda came into picture, and they, you know, uh, told us that there are other alternatives uh, besides having a centralized uh, sewerage system. So they ca came up with a concept of S FSTP. Again, this is a new uh, thing for us. So, uh, so. Uh, the, the leftover uh, would be covered under FSTP. That was what uh, uh, we have uh, discussed and deliberated uh, for a few months. And then ultimately it was decided that yes, we must have the, this FSTP to cover the entire town. Uh, uh, entire town. So, uh, so we deliberated, uh, we have a deliberation, we have discussed uh, how this FSTP will come. Uh, so we, we decided that it would be in PPP mo model. Uh, so government will provide a, a land and machinery and other support, and uh, the border will uh, uh, look after the, uh, the capital investment and later on operational cost. So uh, this was the STP which uh, started, const construction started in uh, June 2017, and then we, were able to complete it, uh, complete it within 45 days. In August 11, 2017, uh, we were able to commission it. Um, so there were few issues. Uh, there were few issues uh, before construction of this uh, STP that how uh, they're going to get their capital investment back and, and how the operational cost will be catered. So what we did is uh, we took uh, two steps. Uh, first, first, we decided that initially our uh, target will be only the hoteliers uh, uh, and other uh, commercial establishment because uh, they were the one who had introduced uh, flush toilet in uh, Ladakh. Uh, and general people st are still happy using the uh, uh, happy using the dry toilets. So, uh, so we came with uh, with an uh, idea that you know uh, all the hoteliers uh, must convert their existing soak pit into a scientific uh, septic tank, 
And secondly, uh, they must pay the municipality in advance. But that was a difficult thing to do. But then we did it because each year this uh, commercial establishment has to come to municipal to, to, uh, to renew their licenses. So, so then these two conditions were put that uh, we will only able to uh, renew your licenses when you fulfill these two conditions. First, to convert the soak pit into uh, proper septic tanks, and s secondly, you have to pay at least a fees for two minimum cleaning a year. Uh, and they agreed. Uh, so we have a proper uh, schedule uh, designing, uh, design for uh, desludging and all. Uh, and then this schedule desludging uh, didn't work because uh, we got so many emergency and demand-based uh, desludging that uh, this become absolutely, you know, remain just on our paper. So, uh, so a few very important uh, things what we have learned is that uh, uh, first of all, in order to get all stakeholders together was before initiating and construct, uh, construction, of, uh, construction of FSTP begins, so we had a series of meetings with different stakeholders of uh, late town. Uh, since it's a, it is a small town, when we are able to make them understand that how the underground water uh, are getting contaminated. Uh, and the problem is that we are still using bore uh, uh, well uh, to pump out the water for uh, drinking and other purposes. So making them convinced that it is the commercial establishment and hotel that uh, are uh, a major contributor uh, for, for the issue, they readily agreed all our terms and conditions. So. What we feel that uh, is before taking any initiative, it is very important that uh, we should put enough time in uh, deliberation, you know, involving all uh, stakeholders. So here, one of the best example, uh, example was that all the hoteliers came forward and they paid us in advance their money and then uh, they have uh, converted their soak, pit in, uh, soak pits into uh, proper septic tanks. So there, there are still, you know, always uh, an apprehension of that how, you know, uh, if, uh, if the system doesn't work, there should always, uh, the government should always have a money, you know, reserve in order to operationalize uh, uh, the FSTP. So uh, initially we f f face, uh, faces few challenges and citizen engagement was one of the uh, qu quite challenging because there are for it for every new thing which is uh, which the government starts there are always people who uh, there are always critics who oppose you know who uh, bring kind of an impediment for the policies but then overcoming overcoming is also not uh, difficult if you put little effort and uh, perseverance uh, uh, to it so enforcing penalties was, uh, again, you know, uh, it was difficult to enforce penalty later on. So that's why we thought to take money uh, uh, right at the start of the financial year. So uh, for the monitoring, and uh, monitoring was quite simple that uh, we and our partner, uh, the Blue Water Company, uh, who are actually uh, doing the operation part, we have clearly uh, divided our uh, task. The task was that it's the municipality who will collect all the money in the municipality who will give all the legal notices to hotel, those who doesn't comply with us. And the Blue Water Company have, just have to focus only on the operational part. So uh, these things uh, we felt initially was a challenge, but then it's a win-win uh, situation for uh, both of us. And, be, and Le being uh, uh, a, a very remote area, a far off places, uh, uh, and these things, uh, this uh, fickle management things, this is uh, this was something new to us. Uh, we always uh, lack in technical uh, skill levels, but then ha somehow Blue Water uh, Company were able to achieve uh, through their uh, uh, operation, uh, through their operation, and also through their uh, uh, company who are operating in other parts of India. Uh, 
Uh, one of the most difficult uh, thing uh, in Leh was that uh, since it, it's, it, it's in a uh, high altitude cold desert, so we have a very cold uh, uh, winter, uh, temperature drops down to minus 50, uh, 15 to 20 degrees centigrade. So the running of STP uh, during winter was not possible, so we have to uh, abandon for at least uh, three to four months, starting from November uh, ending up to ending March. So that, that, that's an again challenge, but the good thing for us is that during winter, uh, tourists doesn't visit to uh, uh, to lay, and then uh, this uh, flush toilet doesn't uh, um, uh, use. So uh, again, as I've mentioned before, that uh, local prefer to use uh, the dry toilets. Um, and how to generate a consistent demand is always uh, a problem uh, that uh, we have able to solve it at the beginning itself. So if you take the, uh, the user fees in advance, you know, uh, people who even don't want to clean their septic tank regularly, you know, they just call us, you know, we have given you money, now come. So generating a consistent demand was not a problem. And I guess uh, the, we were able to do it because we are, we, are, uh, we are a small community, you know, it may or may not be work in the bigger cities and town. So uh, this, uh, that's how our story began, and our entire story of F FSM and FSTP started in 2017, mid-2017, and it's uh, 2019, we were able to clear more than uh, 30 million, uh, able to treat more than 30 million uh, 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 liters of black water. So for us, I, we felt that uh, it was uh, uh, quite uh, encouraging um, uh, result uh, we get in last uh, two to three years. And we are also expecting that since it's a border area, there's a huge amount of uh, presence of army over there. This year, we were able to extend the same services even to the army who were, uh, who were cantonment were in Lay Town itself. And, uh, and I feel that, uh, and we were even planning to expand it uh, further. So uh, it, it was a very win-win uh, situation for all of us our partner or organization for the municipality, for the people, uh, it's just because uh, this uh, PPP model actually worked for us. Thank you. Thank you, Rigsin. Um, Malaysia and Philippines. Please, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, like uh, Najib said, this presentation is uh, actually from uh, two separate abstracts where um, work in Sri Lanka um, was funded by the World Bank and um, analysis of comparison and contrast of uh, different management approaches in Philippines and Malaysia was derived from the training program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so we've seen many exciting and successful examples within citywide sanitation or fecal sludge management. But sometimes it can be difficult for policymakers or practitioners to really apply the knowledge they learned from different cases and studies um, that have different management approaches and institutional arrangements and apply it to their local context. So in our presentation today, our goal is to use three countries um, and examples from there to not only show you lessons learned on different management approaches and institutional arrangements, but more importantly, to draw links and highlight those elements, including legislation, regulation, financing mechanisms, and uh, service delivery that enabled these various dimensions of success. So for the organization of the presentation, first we'll give you a bit of a context of each country with a particular focus on their management approach and their institutional arrangement. And then for the lessons learned, we organized them in two different sections. First will be lessons learned along the sanitation value chain, and second lessons learned uh, particularly focusing on financing mechanisms. Thank you. And let us start with the case of uh, Greater Colombo. Greater Colombo uh, mainly consists of the Colombo Municipal uh, uh, Corporation and surrounding towns and small cities. 
So it's a very familiar story for most of you that uh, only one third of the households have access to sewerage, which is managed by the National Utility Water Board, whereas the Water Board provide water supply services to more than 95% of the households. So the remaining customers, their water customers, are not customers of the sanitation. Conventionally, the Water Board was hesitant to uh, get into other modes of providing sanitation like, F like FSM or other options. But in this context, uh, the GPOB has supported pilot project. GPOB is global partnership on output-based aid uh, managed by World Bank, supported by uh, multi-donor trust fund. And this pilot project introduced uh, a mix of solutions uh, in this uh, greater Colombo. It includes a uh, simplified sewer connection, uh, DWARDS and a PPP for on-site sanitation and FSM. I would talk about that later, uh, but uh, this project has uh, benefited around 9,000 households and uh, going to be completed in this March. So talking about the Philippines, um, citywide sanitation in Philippines really started in 2004 from the Clean Water Act which mandates the government, the national government, to form a national sewage and septage program, but implemented by local government agencies or water district boards. And other legislations uh, required local government agencies or utilities to provide both water and wastewater with septage services and allow them to raise funds to um, invest into capital investments or provide subsidies when it's necessary. And other legislate this integration of water and wastewater services is really critical that enabled certain financing mechanisms and allowed efficient billing, which we will talk about later on. Um, because this is implemented by local agencies, when you have different city contexts, um, you will see different management approaches, and here we show you two of them. Where in Ballywag, it is serving a highly densely urban population um, that has very little land, um, and we're able to secure a commercial loan to finance their treatment plant. In Dumagelti, which is much more typical uh, Philippine cities that are serving a population about 130,000 people spread out, focused on tourism, uh, used a more of a conventional treatment approach and are completely self-funded. The next country, Malaysia, is very interesting. In Malaysia, um, citywide sanitation started with uh, implementation by uh, local government agencies. We are a national uh, government providing a policy requiring private housing developers to design and install sanitation infrastructures such as septic tanks, uh, small sewer connection pipes, or even community scale treatment facilities. Even though this approach alleviated financial burden from local authorities from investing into the capital uh, infrastructure, operation of it turns out to be very difficult because of the commercial drive and weak regulation uh, on the developer side, um, the approach has been failing. As a result, the federal government decided to take a top-down strategy or a centralized approach. So they used the Malaysian constitution to translate the jurisdiction of managing wastewater or septage services from local government to federal government, essentially uh, creating a one single service provider almost nationwide known as Inda Water Consortium. And they set up a very strong regulatory framework um, and known as SPAN, which regulates many aspects of the service provision. Even though this centralized approach might not be uh, applicable were fairly unusual compared to many of the other countries. But the strong regulatory framework with clear enforcement mechanisms can still be valuable lessons. So having seen the brief context of each cities, let us start with key lessons. So the first one we would like to highlight is the importance of adopting a mix of solutions rather than doing just uh, a sewerage network. It's not about 
either storage or FSM. It, the ideal way is to adopt a mix of solution that you can reach all the households in your target area. So in this context of uh, Sri Lanka, what Waterboard did earlier, they used to do only conventional storage uh, uh, systems. But in this pilot project, they adopted a mix of solution. First of all, uh, the households living very near to the network, they provided uh, 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 direct connections. And to those areas where the narrow lanes or people could not access uh, or people uh, or the board could not lay larger pay pipelines, they adopted simplified uh, net network extension, which essentially means using uh, uh, smaller diameter pipes or uh, less depth for the network uh, extension. In some cases, they had to adopt uh, pumping. And they also adopted DWARDs for certain condominiums where they are far from the network, but uh, DWARDs make perfect sense in that locations. And more importantly, in the peri-urban areas, they adopted uh, on-site sanitation with uh, 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 scheduled uh, desludging and uh, transportation to designated treatment systems. For that, they uh, adopted a PPP approach, which I would talk uh, a little later. So the second lesson, uh, which is also important, uh, because uh, many times we focus on the sludge removal and all, but even before that, the uh, on-site treatment system itself is very important. Uh, in South Asia and probably in other parts of the world, when people construct septic tanks, it may not be following the right design. Uh, also, when they may be discharging effluent from the septic tank regularly to an open drain or into the open, uh, open areas, which actually pollutes the environment. Secondly, uh, uh, even though we care about the toilets, the gray water from the house, uh, from kitchen and elsewhere, could also make an unhy unhygienic environment in the neighborhood. So this PPP in, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka ensured that they provide an on-site on treatment system to the low-income households. Uh, the system includes a septic tank, plus an anaerobic upward filter, and a soap pit. The gray water will also direct to the, directly to the soap pit. So there is no wastewater or gray water left in the open. So the, they have a, a hygienic surrounding to live. An important point is these low-income households were living in, mostly living in high water tribal areas. So that is the reason they ensured that they should have an upward anaerobic filter because uh, it should not contaminate the groundwater. So the laboratory test results shows that the water going to the soap pit is actually less, uh, having a BOD of less than 30 milligram per liter, which is uh, uh, the standard of the country. So having a properly designed and installed on-site system um, is very important, but how do we get there? Um, using Malaysia as an example to show you that having a system that clearly defines who is going to do what can really be critical to ensure that the um, on-site sanitation systems are properly designed and installed. Um, under the Water Industry Service Act in Malaysia, it clearly mandates the national regulator span to develop a detailed um, guideline and standard for design of different types of on-site sanitation systems for units, as well as construction uh, standards. And then it regulates uh, the operator, who is the service provider, IWK, to be the certifier to make sure and review all the designs submitted by private uh, housing developers and monitor the entire construction process to make sure that the uh, on-site units are properly constructed as they are designed and to review to make sure that they can be easily and safely accessed for maintenance and desludging. So this process really made sure uh, that all the units are being installed are properly designed and constructed. Moving along the sanitation chain into the emptying and transport stage, uh, we all know scheduled dislodging is very critical in terms of achieving a successful goal of FSM. 
Um, but achieving scheduled dislodging is not an easy task. Again, using Malaysia as an example, between 1994 and 2008, the uh, legislation actually enforced and regulated IWK to provide scheduled dislodging services every two years. So in these 14 years, um, sorry, um, in these 14 years where you can see before 2008, um, the collection or emptying of the septic tanks are quite a lot. However, after 2008, because it is, it is very difficult for IWK to locate, where are all these septic tanks? Because wastewater services or septic services and water services are separate. They were provided by separate providers, so it's very difficult to know where are the septic tanks. Because of this challenge and the assumption that after 14 years of regular deslodging, people may have already changed their behavior uh, and wanting to request septic tank emptying services on their own, uh, the federal government of Malaysia uh, legislated a new legislation that shifted the responsibility of deslodging from the operator into individual household. And this is what happened is after 2008, you see a dramatic uh, decrease of septic tanks being uh, emptied. And this is a direct result showing uh, water quality degradation in nearby rivers. So this, this example really illustrates that having a dis, uh, scheduled dislodging really need a strong regulation and enforcement mechanism. Moving along the sanitation chain again into treatment and recycle. Treatment technology selection is often a question faced by, um, community, uh, by utilities or decision makers. Uh, what I wanted to highlight is the operational requirement that need to be considered when technology uh, selection is being considered. It takes quite a lot for the entire treatment plant to operate in long term for example, uh, budgeting, where is the funding coming from for the operation and maintenance budget? Are the operators are equipped with skills um, that to treat specific technologies? Using Philippines as an example, where Ballywag um, is in a highly urbanized area with very little land, so they chose to have a fully mechanized compact system that looks very modern but takes a lot of money to run and a lot of special skills, which in the planning stage, the utility decided to invest into training their operators and taking into account of the uh, budgetary requirement for operation and maintenance. Where in Dumagelte, the government uh, does not have additional funding resources and all of the money needs to come from user fee and they have lots of land, therefore they decide to use a more natural conventional approach with very little mechanics and chemicals involved uh, with low little cost. Uh, having seen the lessons uh, related to the value chain, let us move towards the lessons related to the financing mechanisms. Before starting the lessons, uh, let us highlight a couple of points. One, uh, the OPEX uh, is comparatively more to a sewerage system, whereas the CAPEX could be much less in comparison to a sewerage system. The OPEX of FSM would be more. And these case studies shows that uh, by collecting user fee alone, you may not be able to make a sustainable uh, uh, operation and maintenance. So there need to be some kind of a subsidy. And the point is, how do you smartly design that subsidy uh, which ensures ownership of the household and ensures sustainable operation. So in Sri Lanka's case, uh, the project adopted a result-based uh, funding mechanism. So the grant given to the government that they would provide to the uh, national utility uh, and the service provider, the private operator would provide services. Once the services are verified by an independent verification agency, then only the money will be transferred from the grant provider to the utility. So that essentially means you have to achieve the results and it has to be verified that the quality is right and it is functioning. Not only that, immediately after the outputs and after six months of service, there will be a second verification. So the payment is made in two tranches, immediately after achieving the outputs and another verification after six months. 
it ensures uh, uh, effective service delivery and uh, quality of the uh, construction and services. Another point to highlight here, this also enabled uh, pre-financing by commercial banks. For example, one of the uh, operator, private operator took a loan of around uh, 1 million US dollars to establish a prefabrication facility. Uh, that also, it also shows uh, an innovative way of uh, mobilizing more funds to address larger projects. Coming to the uh, defledging and treatment part, the subsidy is arranged with a coupon system. So the PPP starts with an agreement, a four-party agreement by the utility, the private operator, uh, the local authority, which is uh, mandated to ensure the safe environment, and the user, the household. When the agreement starts, they, uh, the households get the coupons. And uh, it is not the entire cost of the uh, defledging cost. In the first year, it will be around 50% of the cost. And subsequent years, it will be around 20% of the cost. So what it does is uh, the household has an incentive to call the formal service provider rather than uh, calling an informal service provider. The problem with the informal service provider, there is no guarantee that they uh, collect it properly, safely, or take it to a proper treatment facility. So this provides an incentive to use the uh, formal uh, pro service provider. When they take uh, the sludge to the treatment facility, the designated treatment facility, uh, uh, they, the service provider can encash that coupon. So this, uh, this also ensures that even if it is a, uh, a little farther from the house, there is an incentive for the operator to take to the treatment facility rather than dumping anywhere. And the, uh, the uh, government provides subsidy directly to the utility to operate and the cost of the coupons. So this model uh, has an advantage of ensuring, uh, 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 ensuring quality of the uh, defledging and transportation. It also ensured proper treatment in a, control, in a, in a designated treatment facilities. And important to note that these subsidies are targeted to the low-income households in the world. So a different kind of financing mechanism um, here is enabled by the integrated water and sanitation management in Philippines that essentially allowed cross-subsidy. Uh, so in the case of Ballywag, they used revenue from water to cross-subsidize and fund their sanitation or septage uh, part of the treatment because they can prove to the commercial bank that they have enough of water revenue to repay the loan that they secured to fund the 1.2 million US dollar um, capital investment, as well as able to show that they can gradually increase the water bill, which are um, willing to pay by the individual household, they were really able to secure this very favorable interest rate of only 4% for this commercial loan, not only covering their capital investment, but have continuous funding for their operation and maintenance requirement. And the last lessons learned, uh, which also touches on financing mechanism, is that a bundled service fee that's spread out over time can be affordable for different households. In the case of city of Dumaguete, before the city takes over, uh, private uh, septic trucks uh, comes to empty the uh, septic tanks, and the cost of that uh, for collection alone cost $57 to $191 per trip, depending on how far away it is and depending on how large the septic tank is, which is very expensive and not very affordable. After the city formed a JV with the uh, local water board services, um, they were able to dramatically reduce the cost to $40 to $66 by providing scheduled collection services as well as treatment. The reason they were able to do that is because they spread out the cost over three to five years for each individual household. So for each household, they're only paying about 80 cents on average per month, which is quite affordable. And for very poor household, they're only paying 40 cents per month. So this really allowed um, 
self-funding for both the capital investment and operation and maintenance cost. But the key point is that it is, again, cross-subsidized by water revenue because it's managed by the same service provider. So hopefully, our presentation today showed you some of the enabling elements that allowed the success of in these cases in these countries. And if you have any questions, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are really tight on time, but um, we can have uh, if one, one or two minutes for a few remarks, reflections, and comments. Um. Uh, merci beaucoup uh, pour cette présentation très intéressante. Uh, je sais que... Uh, Donc je disais que en Afrique généralement la vidange de la fosse se fait lorsque tout est bouché et que euh, on a des problèmes dans la toilette. Ça veut dire effectivement qu'on n'applique pas le principe de la vidange, je dirais préventive, mais on fait plutôt une, une vidange curative. Donc le principe de, pla de, de, pla de planifier la vidange des fosses est un principe extrêmement intéressant si on, on veut avoir une vidange complète, parce que simplement si la boue est trop épaisse, c'est difficile, en tout cas pour certains camions, de le faire. Maintenant, les questions sont les suivantes. Euh, si je comprends bien, c'est le public ou la, la municipalité qui assure aujourd'hui la vidange. Est-ce des camions de la municipalité ou plutôt vous travaillez avec des privés Ça, c'est une question. La deuxième, c'est comment vous déterminez le niveau de vie des populations pour un peu serrer les, les paiements qu'on qu qu fait pour ces populations. Est-ce qu'il y a un moyen de suivre l'évolution de ces populations pour voir ceux qui sortent de la pauvreté à un moment donné et les exclure euh, des subventions Merci. OK, one last one. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful presentation, Matthews. Uh, my question is to you. Uh, this is regarding uh, the statement that you made that the capital expenditure for FSM is less than the sewerage systems, uh, conventional sewerage systems, whereas the operational cost is on the higher side. Uh, my question is with respect to Indian conditions. So in Indian conditions, we, we have usually have these septic tanks, which means when we are talking about cost comparisons, cost comparisons between uh, sewerage systems and FSTPs, so usually what we compare is the cost of a sewerage system to only the treatment or the FSTP also collection system. But if I'm talking about the entire chain, which is like having the common denominator, so I also need to have the cost of the on-site system, the collection system, and the treatment system. Also, the effluent that overflows from the septic tanks. So then also, if there's a collection or conveyance system for that, so if you have a soak pit, or if you also have a small bore sewer system. So when, if you do everything, then I don't think we have enough evidences to make the statement that the system is cheaper than that. So I just need your comment on this. In Indian conditions, can we make the statement when it comes to like uh, the total life cycle cost, which is cheaper? Okay, some quick answers. Sure, I'll take the first question. Um, so regarding to the um, desalaging services, um, I think it, the key question is not to say whether it's the public sector who provides the services or the private sector who provides the services. I think the question really is that you need a regulatory framework that ensures scheduled desludging can be enforced. Um, you can contract a private sector to do that or the public sector or the utility itself can decide to do that. So for example, in Ballywag, they decide to contract out to a private operator to perform the dislodging services, but the regulatory framework is still there that making sure the scheduled dislodging is happening. But if the responsibility on the other hand, is shifted to the individual household, then you are relying on the individual household to give you a call to say, okay, my septic tank is full and come to this lodge. Then you are facing the uh, inconsistent demand problem. So the key there really is the regulatory and enforcement framework, not necessarily who is, whether that's a public sector or the private sector to do it. Uh, let me answer the second part of the first question, which is about how do you identify uh, the beneficiaries who require, require uh, subsidy. 
So in Sri Lanka, what they do is there are a number of uh, uh, parameters, uh, like uh, the size of the plot, the uh, floor area of the house, the income of, uh, 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 level based on dormant records. So based on that, uh, they have a criteria. Uh, uh, that determines whether the household will be eligible for a subsidy. Coming to the question on the life cycle cost, uh, I, after my answer, I would uh, leave to Shingi and also because she made a presentation on the first day about India. So the point uh, we were trying to make uh, uh, in about the Sri Lanka um, case was for the water board, the operational cost uh, comes to only $20 per household per year for the sewerage system. But the point I was making is for FF, FSM, the operational cost is higher that they spent more than 30 to 35 dollars. So that, that was the basis of that statement. But good that Schengen did a study, presented a study on India, life cycle cost of comparing both septic tank and FSM. So she may be able to add more reflection on that. Thank you. Um, so yes, on the first day, my uh, colleague Jeanette here uh, with us, and I made a presentation about a life cycle cost for different sanitation infrastructures in particular case in India. Um, I think your question, um, our, our cost framework only looks from the collection all the way to discharge for both fecal sludge management system and sewer system. And you made a good point about completing the entire sanitation chain, which includes the on-site um, units. So I think here there is a big distinction. It's who bears the cost, right? Um, when we were doing our study, the perspective is that we're taking the perspective of service provider, whether you are a private service provider or a public service provider. So from a, the, that perspective, it really sometimes starts, in most cases, especially in India, it starts with collection where the household themselves borne the cost of installing the um, on-site units, or whether that's a septic tank or something else. So when you are considering about that, I think um, even though in the end they will be paying for part of the um, collection and treatment cost, it is important to actually distinguish that it, the different parties who are born the different parts of the cause and who is paying for what. Um, so that, that would be my uh, response to you. And based on our study, starting from the collection all the way to disposal, it is true that for fecal sludge system on the operational cost um, side, the majority of the cost is borne and it's during the collection and transportation part of it and it is higher, proportionally speaking, um, than the capital cost when you look at the life cycle cost. Yeah, thank you so much. So unfortunately, we have to go for the um, closing ceremony. Uh, but finally, I've been Najib, your moderator. It was um, a trick to give you my name at the end so you can remember. And Lindsay uh, from Synergy here. Thank you so much all, and uh, see you all.